In this episode of Ask Paul Kirtley, we are going to be talking about my best bushcraft moment of 2017, introducing kids to canoe camping in Scotland, bow drill material selection, film canister replacement for matches, and topping up a brown bag and water sterilization. Welcome, welcome to episode 64 of Aspor Kirtley, and I am back in the northeast of England. We've had some snow in February. We've had some snow, and it's been um, quite a wintry day today. Been out for a bit of a tramp in the snow. I always like walking in fresh snow, and it's not going to be very long lived, as you can possibly hear on the audio. Um, the snow is already melting off the trees it's already dripping and the sun's come out now the f the front that had the snow has dropped its snow and now we've got uh, clear skies behind it and the late afternoon sun is already melting uh, the snow down so I'm being dripped on it's not too cold I haven't even got my gloves on now I had my gloves on early got my uh, hot coffee and I'm good to go with some questions. Now I'm still catching up with questions from last year. I had a bit of a hiatus with Aspel Kirtley over the new year, Christmas and New Year period, and I was a bit behind anyway. Um, the questions seem to come in fits and starts, and it's clearly then there's a sort of concertina effect where I'm catching up over time, regardless of whether or not um, I take a break, which I had done for various reasons. But anyway, let's get on with it. Let's get on with it. Um, this is from late in the year, so just to explain my rationale for answering this question now in February, why this is happening. So this is from Bushcraft Bod 73, that's Adrian Spring, nice little photo from the summer, and this question via Instagram is, Hi Paul, I would like to ask, if I may, what would be your best bushcraft moment of 2017? A huge thank you for all the hard work you do for us. It is much appreciated. Happy New Year and best wishes for the 17th. You mean my birthday was on the 17th of January. So, um, best bushcraft moment of 2017. Um... It's a tough one because there's lots of good moments. There's lots of good moments where you're working with students on courses uh, and they're making breakthroughs with skills that maybe they've struggled with before or they've just wanted to do. Um, whether it's, people often think I mean bow drill, but I don't always mean bow drill. Things like cordage. People want to get really good at making cordage people want to get good at tree and plant identification people want to get good at there's some there's some uh, spruces here there's some norway spruces people want to get good at being able to tell the difference between the different needle species there's all sorts of little goals that people have and i don't mean to be demeaning by saying little goals but there's all sorts of goals that people have and um yeah it's nice to help people with those so they're all great moments um so picking out one is difficult. Um, one good moment that sticks in my mind is when we're on the Missinibe, the Missinibe River in Ontario, Canada. We did a trip with clients there in September. And <clears throat> the main purpose of the trip is just to cover the, to cover the, um, the route using whatever skills we need along the way and it's not it's not meant to be a survival trip or a bushcraft trip. it's a canoeing trip it, it's a canoeing trip but we will use good efficient campcraft skills along the way we'll use good fire lighting we'll use the fire for cooking we're cooking on fires every day we're producing our water every day and just good campcraft along with the canoe and, that, and that's what we're hoping to get people better at along the way both the canoeing skills and the campcraft skills and to see nature to get deep into nature and to see nature um i did spend quite a lot of time 
looking at tree and plant ID because the people on that trip were interested in that and that was nice to do to go into that environment and work with them on improving their tree and plant ID but one camp we had a rainy day where we'd planned to go out and uh, explore an area of marshes and we still did that in the afternoon but it was a rainy morning and what we did was we did some bow drill because a couple of the people on the trip wanted to do bow drill so i went out and saw some materials in the woods behind our camp and i brought them back into camp and i made a set with them and gave a demonstration and then they had a go um, working in a pair and they both achieved an ember both in the right position just somebody else on the other partner on the other end and yeah, so with no prior experience of bow drilling, it was just something that they'd seen, something they wanted to achieve, and they both generated an ember by working as a pair, um, both taking it in turns to be the person uh, in the driving seat, as it were. And that was really nice because sometimes it can take quite a lot longer than that for people. And just to be there on a damp day, on a wet day, and bring those materials into camp, make the set underneath the tarp and get them to make fire within the space of a few hours of, and, and never having done it before was, was great. That was a standout moment. Um, yeah, I would say that was one of the standout moments. There, there are probably countless others that other people were involved in that could be highlights, but that's just something that came to my mind. Um, really enjoyed the bushcraft festival and for similar reasons just being able to go into the environment in sweden and i blogged about this in one of the wild wanderings and i'll link that um from now on from this episode onwards whatever links i'm going to talk about they're going to be wherever you're watching the video whether you're watching on youtube or whether you're watching on my blog i will put the links directly below the video in the description in both places so you can find those links easily if you are listening on a audio only podcast this is available on many many different platforms now um, from the, the the big ones like apple podcasting app um, soundcloud i put it onto there as well and also it gets distributed out to places like stitcher and um just trying to remember the name of some of the others like some of the other podcasting apps it just gets distributed it's gone out of my head for now i'll come back i'll come back to that but i will link all the podcasting apps that, are, that this is available on that i know of but um the point i'm making is if you're listening to this on an audio podcast please go to paulkirtley.co.uk forward slash ask paul kirtley 64 that's the short link ask paul kirtley 64 and that will take you straight to the page where all the links are that we might talk about and it's the same for every episode if on the next episode i may not mention this but if you're you know in future episodes if you want to go and find any links that we're talking about any links to previous podcasts any links to articles i've written either on my site or off site anything like that all the resources just go paulkirtley.co.uk forward slash ask Paul Kirtley and then just put the episode number and in this case 64 the next one will be 65 and you will go straight to the page where you will find all of that information so that's just something that I'm doing now as well I want people to be able to get to the resources that we talk about here as well as get the information that's directly in the episodes I want people to be able to get to that stuff as quickly and easily and as friction free as possible so below the videos wherever you're watching if you're watching it on my site or on YouTube, which is the only two places I put the video, the links will be below there. If you're listening on audio, go to that short link for the episode. You will get to that page where on my blog where the links are as well. So Bushcraft Festivalen, which was the Bushcraft Festival in Sweden that I did some firelighting workshops at in 2017, as well as being one of the judges on the Swedish uh, bow drilling competition. Um, that was a highlight as well and for similar reasons i guess to why the miss and ivy was a highlight because myself and my two colleagues that came with me we went into that environment and we got all the resources that we needed to teach our workshops from that immediate environment um you know we'd flown in 
on the plane to Stockholm, just had our personal gear with us. We had a big tarp just for in case it was raining. But other than that, we just had personal gear and all the resources that we needed for teaching those fire workshops over the course of two days, we got from the immediate environment. And we made bow drill sets from juniper, we made bow drill sets from willow, we made bow drill sets from pine, and we made uh, feather sticks from various materials. We got various tinder materials, grasses, juniper bark, um, various other uh, things like honeysuckle. We got various different things from that environment and used all of them, bracken as well. We got all of those from that environment and we made fire in multiple different ways. And that was really nice to do. Um, but to me, both of those examples highlight what bushcraft is about. It, it's your ability to go into the environment, f identify and locate the resources you need, and then have the skills to use them to the ends that you want to. And so to me, those are probably the two highlights that that's a sort of pure expression of what bushcraft is about to me, uh, particularly when you go to places that you're not from. It's all well and good going to places where you're familiar with, but going, um, canoeing down a river you've never been down before, camping at a campsite you've never been before, going into the woods and finding materials for bow drill in a foreign country on the other side of the world and making fire, brilliant. Going across to Scandinavia, having a relatively short period of time to get all the materials ready that we needed, not just for our demonstrations, but also for all of the, the, uh, the many scores of people who came to our workshops to have materials for them to use as well, to be able to gather all of that locally and for everyone to be able to get as much as they did from those workshops, that was fantastic. And to me, that's what bushcraft is about. It's not about all of the equipment, although some equipment is useful in the outdoors, of course, we don't just go out in our underwear, and we've talked about this lots of times before, but to me, that's an expression of what bushcraft is about. So those were two highlights for me, Adrian, and thanks for asking the question. And thanks for the birthday wishes as well, much appreciated. Right, next question. Introducing kids to canoe camping in Scotland. This question is from Callum and he says, I want to introduce my young children who are both under 10 to canoe camping in Scotland. What rivers would you recommend to start with? Also, I am thinking or I'm thinking at, uh, maybe he means I'm thinking of purchasing an alley collapsible canoe as I don't have the means to transport a 16 foot rigid one. Do you have any experience of the alley canoe? And if so, what are your thoughts? Thanks in advance. Best wishes, Cal. Um, well, to answer the last question first, Callum, no, I don't have any experience of using that specific canoe myself. I think you have to take collapsible canoes on a case by case basis. Some of them are very good. Some of them are not so good. Um, some of them are flimsy. Some of them are very good and rigid um, when, they're, when they're put together personally i haven't used that one if anybody has used the canoe that callum's talking about maybe if you could leave a comment um forward slash as paul kirtley 64 on my site if you could leave a comment that might be helpful that would be good um but i would ask if if you don't have the means of transporting a larger canoe how you're going to transport a collapsible canoe um but, but, because presumably if i can not fall over my words presumably you're going to be using a, a car and if so, get a roof rack. It's not difficult to get a roof rack, get a rigid canoe. I understand you might not have space to store a rigid canoe. That's a bigger issue for a lot of people. But if it's just a case of getting a roof rack um, and you're looking at buying a canoe, um, particularly if you want ultimately to go onto rivers, I'd be looking at getting a proper canoe, um, a modern canoe, a plastic, you know, 16 foot, something like that, 16 foot prospector and get a roof rack for your car and then you're good to go so unless you're telling me you've got a you know convertible um soft top or something um then um, i would get a a roof rack and get a, a canoe that would be my advice that said if if that isn't an option you want to get into canoeing and you need to get a collapsible canoe for whatever reason then i would not be recommending either way whether you get a rigid canoe or a a folding canoe to be going straight onto rivers particularly not with kids um, unless it's very very sedate and a good number of the rivers in Scotland that are worth tripping on are not necessarily that sedate in a lot of places some stretches of them are but um, I think you need to make sure that everyone is 
fundamentally clear about safety aspects. Um, I would definitely read the sections in Ray Goodwin's book about canoeing with kids. I'd be very wary of them getting cold much more easily than adults do, particularly if they fall in. You, as the responsible adult, need to be absolutely clear about what happens if you all end up in the water, even on a flat piece of water, particularly on a flat piece of water where you may be much further away from the bank than you might be on a river. Um, you need to be very uh, conscious of wind um, if you're on flat water and how that affects your ability to get to and from the shore. You need to be very conscious of the effects of wind in terms of creating waves as well as maybe preventing you from getting where you need to. These are key fundamental safety aspects of paddling for anyone but particularly if you're paddling with kids and responsible for kids um, they will not last as long in the water as you will do for a given temperature you all need to have buoyancy aids that is just not negotiable and um, what you see a lot of is parents concerned for the kids will buy their kids buoyancy aids and they won't have them for themselves and then if they fall in it's the parents that drown and the kids are rescued or the parents are just not in a position to help the kids. You must have a buoyancy aid, your kids must have buoyancy aids, they must fit properly and kids grow and so you need to make sure that the buoyancy aids do fit properly at the time you buy them and you need to be able to control that boat and if you at all you are in any doubt about your ability to control the boat and make it go where you want to, get some instruction. Yeah, there are plenty of very good quality canoe instructors in the UK. The British Canoeing uh, Union as it was, or British Canoeing as it is now, has a very good system of developing uh, canoe leaders and canoe coaches and you should get some proper instruction. It's not that expensive, particularly when it comes to being safe around water. Um, so those would be some of my pieces of advice. And then I would be looking to do some relatively sheltered canoe camping. You live in Scotland, so you've got the benefit of being able to uh, camp in many more places than you might do if those bodies of water were in England or Wales. So you can do relatively short trips, stay close to shore, go on a sheltered piece of, uh, of water, stay close to shore do a nice little trip, get them used to the routine of getting in and out of the boat, setting up camp, having a little campfire, all of those great things that are part and parcel of canoe tripping. You don't need to be doing huge great distances and then as your experience and competence increases, as the kids experience and competence increases, that is their ability to help motivate um, the boat itself, their ability to power the boat increases, then you can go further. Um, if you do too much with them too early, you'll put them off. And so definitely think about the safety, make sure you fully understand that. There are too many tragedies in the past where parents have taken kids out for, or, or just inexperienced people have gone out not knowing what they don't know. Make sure you do know what you don't know and then make sure you learn it. Make sure you get good instruction if you need it and don't bite off more than you can chew to start off with. Those would be my pieces of advice for you. Um, and if you've got any more questions, just jump in the comments below this and, and ask away. Oop. Got some drips of water on the screen, oh dear. Okay, next question. Another one from email from Vince. Vince Leroyd. His question is, as always, I would like to begin by thanking you for all the invaluable information you impart on your podcast. My question is concerning bow drill material selection. Um, I have practiced bow drill for a few years and have made dozens of sets with pretty consistent results. I know my technique is good and my set construction is now well refined, but I'm hitting a wall with material selection. I know what woods to use and what to avoid, but sometimes I find myself laboriously polishing squeaky hearths. How can I determine what is too far seasoned from what is ideal? Any tips for selecting good bow drill wood will be of enormous help to my skill set. Many thanks, and I look forward to seeing you on the elementary bushcraft course in April. Um, 
I sometimes have deja vu moments when I'm reading these questions because I do read some of them when they come in. Clearly they come into my inbox and then they're put into a file in my notebook so that I can answer them at future reference. I, I almost feel like I've answered this question before, Vince, whether it's this particular question from you. I've certainly answered similar questions before. Um, the fundamental thing is I've met you before, Vince. You seem quite a strong guy. Um, it's possible you're polishing the ends of the spindles because you're not putting enough pressure on it. But if you've had success with bow drills in the past, possibly not. Um, I would suspect that the, the thing I would be looking at first with you, without seeing you, you do the bow drill, is um, be checking whether or not you're selecting materials that are too hard. Um, that, to me, would seem to be the main reason. You could be using materials that are a bit moist, but you've got enough strength and capability to still be getting smoke and blackening the ends. But just because they're a little bit damp and there's some lubrication there, you might be polishing the ends. That's one thing. And the other thing is that they could just be too hard, that they haven't seasoned enough. It's unlikely that they're too seasoned. It's more a case of they're still just so solid. So Willow is a prime example of this. Um, if it's too hard, it becomes physically difficult to put enough pressure on to get the wood to grind into the hearthboard. It tends to polish and then you're on a, a, a descending um, vicious circle, as it were, of as it becomes more polished, it becomes harder to get the friction. As it becomes harder to get the friction, it becomes more polished and so on and so forth. So um, what you can do is rough the end up and rough the inside of your um, of your notch uh, where you're drilling into uh, the top of the, uh, the hearth where you're drilling into. You can rough both of those up. You can drop a bit of dry sand in. That can be enough to get it going again. Um, you can scrape the end of your spindle with the, with the edge of your knife. You can scrape up the inside without chewing it up too much just so it starts to bind into each other but fundamentally what you need to do if you're asking about material selection the key thing particularly if you're using things like willow is that fingernail test can you make an impression relatively easily with your fingernail not so that it just goes in and you know it, it, there's no substance to it but if you're having to press so hard that you're bending your fingernail, it's going white and it hurts, it's too hard. You should be able to make a reasonable impression with your fingernail without burying your thumb in it, because um, then it would be too soft. Reasonable impression with your thumbnail. Um, if it isn't, if it's too hard, then it's gonna be too hard to drill. So that would be something I'd be looking at. To make sure it's dry and dead, and then if it is, make sure it's not too hard. And if it is still polishing, look at how much pressure you're putting on. But if it's polished, try and rough it up first. That might just make the difference. Film canister replacements for matches is the next question. This is from Thomas Gray via email. Thomas from Switzerland. Do you have any good ideas for modern replacements for the film canister? Back when I was scouting in the 1980s, it was easy to find convenient small waterproof cases for matches, tinder, etc. at the local camera shop, but I can't find anything suitable nowadays. What do you use? Cheers, Thomas. Well, Thomas, um, I still do have a bag full of camera, canister, camera film case canisters. I can't even speak today. Camera canisters. Uh, not camera canisters, camera film canisters. More coffee. <laughs> Too many C's in that. Camera, case, canister. Choose two of those words, not three. I think that's the problem. I still have a bag full of those and I do sometimes still use them for bits and pieces. Um, but you can get lots of other little um, match safes now. It used to be that match safes were those horribly heavy um, brass things, um, sometimes with a compass in the end. And you can still get those and they're kind of a bit sort of vintage and, and nice, but in that respect, but they're heavy and some of them can be really quite difficult to open depending on the design. Uh, there was a sort of uh, a, f uh, a metal one where you could screw, this wasn't brass, it was just um, chrome plated something or other quite thin metal and the screw always just seemed to get stuck and they were hard to open and I'm not quite sure if they were that waterproof and um, they had like a folding lid so you screwed it off and then it lifted and then it came out they weren't so great and um, the brass ones were all right but they're heavy what you can get these days is um, 
two things which I think work particularly well. One is there's a plastic uh, type of canister which is about the same size as a film canister, which I believe is a US military canister. Um, it's quite knurled, it's screw fitting uh, lid and it has a rubber seal on it. And I've seen those for sale both in green, um, in various other shades of natural colors, brown, a sort of desert color um, and then you can get them in bright orange as well and they work pretty well I've used those you can put matches in there and then stick a bit of cotton wool in the top to stop them rattling around too much they have a striker on the inside of the lid and they work quite nicely and they're a similar size to what you're talking about the other ones which I've seen um, quite a lot of recently um, increasingly on Amazon and eBay are aluminium um, either similar size ones to the ones we've been talking about or bigger and they're designed to either put matches in specifically or designed for sort of everyday carry bits of um, survival kit and they're waterproof they've got single or double uh, rubber seals on them they're light because they're machined aluminium um, a bit like a, a mini uh, sig bottle if you like with a screw top um, and they work well and i keep one of those in my buoyancy aid when i'm on trips and that has um it has a better striker on the inside um, the screw fitting is halfway down on the one that i use it screws open and then there's a, uh, a plate on the inside with a striker on it and you've also got access to the matches so and you can put some cotton wool and or other bits and pieces in there as well uh, for padding for packing so that the match heads don't get rattled to pieces over time um, and those are all good so um, any or all of those that I've talked about and again that's that almost sounds to me like a little blog post that I need to do doesn't it sort of match case alternatives uh, to use uh, these days and maybe I'll do that um, but hopefully that helps um, and that brings me on to another thing actually that I was going to mention uh, some questions that I get are very long in the question asking particularly if they're sent by email and I have no problem you know I appreciate people taking the time to ask a question and to give some uh, context and some background as to why they're asking the question or why they're feeling like they need a solution to the particular question that's absolutely fine sometimes they're a bit long to read out on on this show but more importantly I have to consider the length of my answer and there are some questions I, I've had a few along similar lines of where I go walking I have um, this number of different species of tree I you know I, I've learned to identify sycamore hawthorn uh, spruce oak uh, cherry da 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 please could you tell me all of the uses for these trees asked Paul Kirtley um, it's not the right format for that because that that's kind of almost a small pamphlet that I need to write there um, to, to convey that information um, and also to do it in a way that's very uh, structured so that it, it's easy to to consume um, I could sit here sort of firing off ideas off the top of my head about how to use all these different species but I would probably get to the end and think oh, I forgot to mention that or I forgot to mention some caveats or what have you so there are some questions which are just too big for me to answer in a coherent way um, that doesn't take up too much time on here that doesn't mean to say I don't want you to send them in because what I've been thinking is because I've been trying to catch up with questions and I'm, I'm trying I've sort of got the next few episodes planned out and I've been going through the questions and and thinking I'll answer these five I'll answer those five I'll answer that five in each episode but clearly I have to sort of choose uh, and there are some that are that they're, they're either very long questions that might also need an involved answer or something that definitely needs a long answer that I can't put into these Ask Paul Kirtleys. But what I'm thinking is that they are good, if they're good questions and the answers would be valuable, which most of them are, um, they're good ideas for blog posts that I will try and put out so do keep an eye on my blog because you might just see something pop up on my blog that answers your question and particularly if it's a very general thing it's not time dependent it's not like you're going on a trip next week and you want a specific answer to something um, 
but if it's a general thing like uses of types of trees that's something that is going to last a long time and I should put that probably on my blog rather than have it buried deep in an Aspore Kirtley that nobody's going to find in a few months time and um, that would be a better place for it so please keep sending the, ans the, the answers please keep sending the questions in if I don't answer your question please don't be offended there are two main reasons why I don't answer them. One is some, some questions are just a bit silly um, and you could easily Google the answer. Um, I think occasionally there's a bit of laziness going on there or people just asking questions for the sake of it. And it's like, I'm not gonna add a lot of value by answering that. You can Google it and get an answer to that in two minutes. Um, it, it's not dependent upon my experience or my viewpoint or my um, perspective to give you a, valid, a valuable answer. Um, they can be, the questions can just be way too long or the answers that I think I'm going to have to give to be able to give a decent answer to the question are going to be way too long. Um, and then the other reason why I don't always answer every single question that comes in, certainly not at the time that it comes in, is because I might get somebody asking me half a dozen questions over the course of several weeks. And it's not fair of me to answer one person's questions to the exclusion of other people. So I have to be selective, it, try and you know, try and treat everybody fairly as well. I may well get back around to those questions eventually if that person then doesn't ask lots of, they'll sit in the question bank. Um, so just to explain a little bit about what's going on with the questions behind the scenes, um, please don't take that as me being churlish and being snotty about any of the, any of the questions that people ask, I'm not. Um, Sometimes you might get a quicker answer and just as good an answer by googling them. If you really need my perspective, I'm very, very happy to give it. And you know, I'm working within those parameters. And I'm going to try and use some of the questions to um, to provide some inspiration for some blog posts as well that are going to help you and a lot of other people and going to be more visible for longer. Because as good as this show is, the problem that I have with it sometimes, like that question that Vince asked I'm sure I've answered similar questions to that before and I can't remember which episode it was in and it's going to take Vince a long time to find it he's going to have to look through 63 episodes maybe to find it um, 60 hours probably six you know 50 to 60 hours of content maybe to listen to to get the answer that's not efficient use of his time either anyway enough of my thinking out loud about what works on here and what doesn't quite work on here. I think we've got one more question to do. Topping up a brown bag and sterilization. Uh, this is from Instagram. This is from Gavin Henry. And he asks, when topping up the brown bag with a saucer from a billy can or crusader mug, how do you clean that if you're then boiling the water that drips into your billy can? Just rinse it with boiling water. When topping up, right, okay. So yeah, you can use the saucer. You need to make sure it's sterilized afterwards. The easiest way to sterilize it is to chuck it on the fire. Um, but clearly then you need to be careful not to burn your hands when you take it off. That's the easiest way. Um, with any metal mug or cup, heat will sterilize it that's the great thing about metal over plastic um, you can use direct heat to sterilize it in terms of the billy can you're probably also concerned about the fact that maybe it's got grit in it you know the reason you're putting it through a brown bag or a mill bank bag is that you have suspended matter in the water if you're scooping it up with a with a um container that you're then going to be using later yes it needs to be sterilized you can rinse it out with some of the water that's coming out of the out of the uh, the other end of the brown bag because that should be clear um, and you can rinse out the the grit or the suspended matter or what have you with that but then it still needs to be um, sterilized heat again or if you're boiling water in it if you've got it over the fire and you've got water boiling in it then that's also going to sterilize it so in terms of sterilization it's heat in terms of rinsing it out you can use the water that hasn't yet been sterilized but just make sure that you then sterilize the container afterwards it's just about having some systems and discipline the the the, the it's normally all right if you're on your own because you, you know what everything's been used for. It's when you're with other people in camp 
and you need to make sure that everybody understands the system that you're using, what's clean, what's dirty, what's got clean water in it, what still needs to be sterilized. You just need to come up with a little system that those things over there need sterilizing, that water over there has boiled and is waiting to cool, this container here has been used to top up or what have you, don't use that for eating off until it's been sterilized and if it's been sterilized it'll be over there. You can quickly come up with systems like that, you always have to frankly in, in camp um, to make sure that nobody uh, is consuming things that they shouldn't be. That brings us to the end of this episode of Asheville Kirtley. Uh, the sun is going down over there. It's starting to, the temperature's starting to drop. I think we're going to get a, a freeze on this semi-melted snow um, in the not too distant future. I can already feel the cold on my back. It's, it's quite a lot colder than when I sat down just a little while ago. So I will get on the move and finish my walk before it gets dark. But thank you for your attention. Thanks for listening. Keep the questions coming in. Um, really appreciate your interest in the answers. And of course, please share this with other people that you think might benefit from this. Um, takes a bit of effort in making these, in organizing them, in getting them up on the internet, and getting them onto all the podcast platforms. Player FM was one of the other ones. Uh, Squarecast, I think, is another one that I was thinking of. It's on SoundCloud, it's on iTunes, it's on uh, Stitcher, it is on. <clears throat> the Apple podcasting app as well. And I know through some of those feeds, it also ends up on some other platforms as well. So please subscribe on your favorite podcasting platform. That helps me. It helps the visibility of the podcast on those platforms so that other people who may like this content will see it. And also please share it with your friends. We tend to have friends who have similar interests to us. Please share it with your friends that you may think would benefit from these shows. That all helps me uh, make it worthwhile for everyone. So thank you very much. Appreciate it. Stay safe in the outdoors and I will see you on episode 65 of Ask Paul Kirtley.